Good evening, and welcome to Sacred Heart University. My name is Rob Gilmore, and I'm the Director of Campus Experience in the Office of Undergraduate Admissions. It's our pleasure to be with you this, this evening for our virtual chat for the College of Arts and Sciences, the School of Communication, Media, and the Arts, the School of Social Work, and the Isabel Farrington College of Education. Tonight, we're going to bring you an opportunity to uh, chat strictly with the admission staff at Sacred Heart, as well as some of our faculty from the colleges and the schools. Tonight is an opportunity for you to ask as many questions as possible. And while we might not get to all of your questions, we will follow up with a detailed email and video trying to answer as many questions as we can. This is a, uh, a time for us at the university to work with you as we march towards the deposit deadline of May 1st, which we can uh, firm, confirm tonight uh, that we will be keeping. And that's an opportunity to get those questions answered because as seniors, this is a trying time for you to decide where you're going to be going for your future in higher education. Once again, it's our pleasure to be with you tonight, and let's get started. We're joined this evening by the Executive Director of Undergraduate Admissions at Sacred Heart University, Pam Pillow. Pam is a two-time graduate of Sacred Heart, 2007 and 2018. Good evening, Pam. Good evening, Rob. So Pam, talk a little bit about uh, this class uh, and the background of the class of 2024 and uh, the role of the admissions process right now. Absolutely. So we have had our largest applicant pool ever to the institution this year, and you all are among the most qualified applicants. You are our admitted students. Congratulations to you and your families. Our applicant pool was not only the largest, it was our highest qualified. So our admitted students boast an average GPA of a 3.5, test scores of over a 1210. We have received applications from across 23 states and 10 countries. So. Uh, we are extremely honored that you're joining us this evening, able to ask your questions. We wish we could see you here on campus in person. Hopefully we can do that soon, um, but we know that this is a, a great alternative for you to get to know a little bit more about us uh, and also our faculty, alumni uh, that we have here uh, available to answer any questions that you might have this evening. So Pam, just uh, going forward as we are in this new age of virtual Correct. connection with our students out there, what can some of these students expect over the next couple of weeks from our office? Absolutely. You will be receiving uh, regular updates via email, text, and calls from your admission counselor. Feel free to reach out to us at any point in time if you have any additional questions. We can properly connect you with the financial aid office as well. Um, so we are here for you. We will be regularly communicating with you um, on the course to, like we said, that May 1 deadline. But we are also monitoring this rapidly changing situation very closely. So if anything changes uh, on our end, we will update you accordingly. And as Pam said, we are monitoring the situation. So as you will see currently and through the night, we are practicing safe social distancing right. here today. So there is a, a, a break between us tonight to uh, keep everybody in the room safe. Uh, we are um, just about 42 days away right now from May 1st, and as we've been saying so far tonight, that May 1st deadline, the National Deposit Deadline, will be uh, in place for the university. However, if things were to change down the road, we will immediately uh, let you know uh, as we go through. The one thing that I think we also want to uh, remind the students is uh, to continue to connect with your admissions counselor, uh, whether it be by email, phone, text. Um, and we also have the capabilities for video conferencing as well so that we can meet with you face to face. I know there's many students out there that have already been accepted at the university. There's also students out here who have already deposited and committed to Sacred Heart. Uh, but there are some students out there, a small group of you, who had received a letter from us over the last couple of weeks. So I'm going to have Pam talk a little bit about that letter and what the next steps are for those students. Absolutely. So, I mean, getting to know Sacred Heart, visiting Sacred Heart is a big piece of the admissions process and it's critical to your decision making. So we like to see all of our candidates connect with us. Um, for those of you who may have received a letter asking you to schedule a visit by April 1st, um, we will count your login, registration, viewing of this virtual event as a visit. Uh, we will also um, have our admissions counselors reaching out to you to schedule one-on-ones to ensure that all of your questions are answered and also get to know a little bit more about the institution. All right. So uh, with that, we're going to get started with our chat tonight. 
Uh, we're going to break this up into segments uh, so that we can provide systematic information to you about the College of Arts and Sciences, uh, the schools of computer science, uh, sorry, so the schools of uh, communication, media, and the arts, the school of social work, and then the Isabel Farrington College of Education. Uh, so we're going to bring up guests as we go through tonight. Continue to add your questions. Uh, once the questions come in, we will try to get them into the chat and get them answered live. If not, then we will be following up with those questions in a FAQ or frequently asked questions style. Uh, opportunity that will be mailed to email to you over the next couple days. So we're going to say goodbye to Pam for a little bit. Thank you. Uh, she's going to go off and I'm going to bring up our first guest tonight. Uh, he is the uh, Associate Dean for the College of Arts and Sciences as well as an Associate uh, Professor in the Department of Biology here, Dr. Mark Jarrett. Good evening, Mark. Good evening. How are we doing? I'm doing good. All right, very good. Hope everyone's uh, doing well out there. Yeah, very good. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk a, a little bit about the overview of the College of Arts and Sciences, mm -hmm. um, and uh, then I'll get into some questions for sure. you. So the first is, can you talk about the function of the College of Arts and Sciences uh, on the campus of Sacred Heart University? Sure. Uh, the College of Arts and Sciences, we're the largest college. We have 13 departments and offer you know 20 plus undergraduate majors and a number of graduate programs. I think a key thing that we do is we really are the stewards of the liberal arts uh, core at the university. So regardless of whether a student is majoring or planning on going to the College of Arts and Sciences or any college, really they're taking courses within the College of Arts and Sciences um, from their freshman year, um, getting that liberal arts education um, that we really think is critical to developing them as lifelong learners and sort of global citizens of the world. So as a liberal arts institution, which Sacred Heart is, the central focus lies within the College of Arts and Sciences. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, as the, uh, the college uh, has the um, opportunity to connect with individual majors, students will also be taking uh, part of their core requirements through the College of Arts and Absolutely. Sciences. Absolutely. Can you talk a little bit about the core program here at the university? Sure. The core program is set up in that there's sort of a foundational core area where all students take 10 courses um, that really span the liberal arts in terms of humanities, in terms of social sciences, in terms of physical sciences, natural sciences. Um, and all students sort of get that foundation in terms of also writing as well as critical thinking. Um, once they've taken those courses, they also are taking two courses in the Catholic intellectual tradition. Um, we have CIT 201, 202. That's a flagship of our university and a key part of liberal arts education. And then students can really begin to explore other areas of the liberal arts, um, taking additional courses that count towards social global awareness, natural sciences, or, and the humanities as well. Okay, so let's talk about the different areas of the College of Arts and Sciences. Mm -hmm. First, let's start with the physical sciences. Okay. So uh, within the physical sciences, we have biology. Biology, chemistry, um, those are the two main areas, and sort of both of those um, departments offer several majors. Um, that's also in the Department of Chemistry, it's really Department of Chemistry and Physics. So we have majors like biochemistry, chemistry, and then in biology, we have biology, molecular and cell biology, coastal marine science. We also have an interdisciplinary major from biology that connects with psychology, neuroscience, so it really is there, it's joining the social sciences with the natural sciences. Okay, uh, and then also within uh, the biology department lies uh, one of the bigger assets of the College of Arts and Sciences, which I know many students out there are, tonight are probably interested in, and that is pre-health advisement. Right. So for those of you who are going to be on a track or would like to go to medical school or some variation of medical school, whether it's dental school or osteopathy or veterinary or mm -hmm. um, ph uh, physician assistant, you would actually be majoring uh, or on a track within the College of Arts and Sciences. Right. So a pre-health advising program, and, and I'm one of the faculty who's on the pre-health advising committee, um, been associated with that for quite a while. The pre-health advising program is really a program that's designed to help anybody interested in any kind of graduate health profession, um, really help them figure out the health profession that fits best with them, and help them put together the best application possible by the end of their four years here at Sacred Heart. So for many of these people, they'll have uh, possibly two advisors, mm -hmm. correct? Their uh, traditional uh, academic advisor, and then they'll also have the pre-med advisor or the pre-health advisor mm -hmm. who will be getting them prepared for their next step after Sacred Heart. Absolutely. 
you're, when, when it comes to advising, you'll always have, initially when you first come in, you get a freshman advisor, and then when you officially declare your major, then you'll transition from the freshman advisor to your academic major advisor. Throughout that whole process, from, the, from your first day that we come meet with you, that you're, you actually get to campus here, um, you get to meet with your pre-health advisor, and you'll have a pre-health advisor throughout, the, throughout your entire time here, and they work in concert with your academic advisor to make sure you're taking the courses that you need to prepare for the graduate health profession you want, med school in terms of getting those prerequisite courses, um, and then they'll also advise you on terms of your extracurriculars in addition to that that are relevant. All right. Uh, let's go on to the humanities side sure. of the College of Arts and Sciences. So uh, this is um, uh, majors such as English, English. Uh, foreign languages and cultures, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, Spanish is the major within mm -hmm. that. Um, and then we also have history, history. criminal justice. I'm going to continue. Oh, right. Sure. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, we, we have, um, there's criminal justice. And so, I mean, humanities here, there's humanities and social sciences. We're going to sort of do them as a group together. Um, so you have criminal justice, you have political science. Um, also in the humanities, we still have philosophy and theology and religious studies. Um, psychology, psychology, sociology. sociology, going and social work on the um, on the history. side of history, which things. I was a history major. Right. There you go at Sacred Heart. Right. So. And actually, we, Can't we, we, that. we will we will have um, another associate dean coming up later to also talk about the School of Communications and Media and the Arts, and they'll talk about all the majors within that, which is also a key part of the humanities as well. All right, and then the um, two other pieces that I want to talk to you about very quickly before we get to some questions, because we have a lot of questions coming in. Mm -hmm. First of all, quickly just talk about uh, study abroad options. Study abroad options. So we are very, um, right, we, we work with students to always come up with a way that they can study abroad regardless of what major they're in. And so whether it's in the natural sciences, physical sciences, we have opportunities to study abroad. Um, humanities, you, you name it. I think one of the key places that many of our students go is our own campus in Dingle, Ireland. Um, and so we've developed both semesters, you know, full semester, fall semester, or spring semester, as well as short courses um, that you can take sort of during the summer, you typically in May. Um, and so we have hundreds of students from arts and sciences studying abroad every year. All right. And then Quickly just talk about some of the grad opportunities within the College of Arts and Sciences sure. and some of the accelerated programs mm -hmm. that are available. So we have um, 10 different graduate programs in Arts and Sciences and every single one of them has a way in which you can combine an undergraduate major to go right into the graduate major and effectively complete both the bachelor's and a master's within five years. Um, there we, we, you're talking about, um, I'll let, I'll let Jim talk about School of Communication, Media, and Arts for their graduate programs, um, but we also have, in addition to uh, graduate programs within the School of Communication, Media, and Arts, we have criminal justice, we have a master's in public administration, a master's in social work, um, we have the master's in chemistry, um, applied psychology in terms of industrial and organizational psych. Yeah. You know, plenty of a options. A lot of options. Yes. Yeah. All right, we're going to get through some uh, very quick questions here. Sure. All right, can you combine majors and minors within different colleges? Absolutely. So if you wanted to be a psychology major and minor in finance, that's an option? Definitely. Okay. I, I've, I've, we've had students who, who've done that across colleges many times. And Jen, that would just be you working in sync with your academic advisor? Absolutely. Okay. Um, are the biology and chemistry classes located in one area on the campus? Um, generally, all the, the labs in general are, are located in the science wing. So. Um, if you're going to have a lab class, yes, you're definitely going to be sort of within typically one wing of the ac academic building and, and often our lectures are there. Um, we do have lectures in some of the other buildings. I mean, this is the Martiri Center for the Liberal Arts and, and the science courses are also part of the Liberal Arts, so yeah. you'll occasionally have lectures here in the sciences as well. Okay. Uh, just two more questions. Are there required religion courses? Um, as part of the foundational core, we have a core, we, we have an area that's, that's religious studies, but that can run a wide gamut of religious studies types of courses. Um, from a course that I know some students really enjoy, religion and science fiction, to world religions, to Islam, to Judaism, to theology. So um, every student takes a course in religious studies as a way of sort of getting, um, right, having, having 
a broad background in terms of how religious studies as a discipline sort of really approaches questions. But that also talks to the, the center of the university, the Absolutely. center mindset of the university being a Catholic institution, Yes, that we want students to have that in the liberal arts tradition. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, and then the last question uh, I'm going to uh, help, have you help us answer today sure. is about uh, the honors program sure. and how uh, for students who have been admitted uh, to the honors program, because there are some students out there that have already gotten their letters saying that mm -hmm. they've been admitted for the Thomas More Honors Program at Sacred Heart. What does that freshman year look like if you're in the honors program? Um, the freshman year is designed so that you have your major interest courses and in addition to that you'll be taking um, honors courses within your first year seminar, your first year writing seminar. Um, typically you'll also take an honors course within the critical thinking course as well. So we have students coming in and, and the honors program is really both you take courses with other honors students um, that very often typically are meeting more your core requirement courses. Occasionally you'll have an honors course offered within your major, depending on your major. Um, and then the honors program also offers a number of extracurricular, co-curricular activities outside the classroom. As and well. our honors program, uh, freshman year, you'll be living in Pierre Toussaint Hall. Mm -hmm. uh, that is our honors housing. Uh, and that also offers opportunities for students can congregate right. and to collaborate Absolutely. within the building. It's a living learning community. And, and that's intentional to have the students all together, again, because you're sort of both doing things in the classroom as part of the honors program but also outside of the classroom, going on trips, doing activities. Um, so yes, it's, it's sort of important to sort of have the whole um, experience revolve. Yeah. And then because of the extra work being put in at the core uh, requirements for the honors program, mm -hmm. and then also the uh, assignments that they'll be doing, mm -hmm. they'll actually be picking up a minor in honors. Absolutely. It's an 18 credit uh, yes. pathway. Mm -hmm. So they'll be minoring in honors once they graduate. Absolutely. All right. So uh, Dr. Mark Jarab, we thank you for joining us. We'll bring you Thanks. back up for questions. Okay. We're going to bring up uh, one of our alumni from the College of Arts and Sciences who actually functions as one of our admissions counselors here at Sacred Heart University. I'd like to introduce Greg Diaz. Greg is a 2015 undergrad uh, graduate from Sacred Heart and then also a 2017 uh, graduate graduate from Sacred Heart, uh, both in criminal justice, correct Greg? Yes. All right, so Greg, first of all, talk a little bit about your experience within the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, my experience was pretty great. Um, when I came in, I actually was a double major. I wanted to double major in criminal justice and bio. Um, and I soon found out that was a little difficult for me, um, but I had a really great advisor, and she was actually my freshman advisor that I talked to through most of this. Um, she was in the history department, and she recognized that I was kind of struggling uh, pretty early on having all those um, courses that I had to do for my double major, and um, she called me into her office. I didn't reach out to her yet. She called me in herself, um, and she said, Greg, listen, I know you're struggling. Let's talk about this. Let's see what we can do to make sure that you're happy academically. That way you want to be here for four years yeah. and you want to finish your degree and, and be happy. So you uh, majored in uh, criminal justice, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of the larger programs within the College of Arts and Sciences. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your academic experience within criminal justice? Sure, yeah. Um, so I don't know the exact number of professors, but the cohort itself of criminal justice, although pretty large, um, was like a small family. Uh, all the uh, professors, both full-time and adjunct professors, knew all the students. They um, held like different social events through the Criminal Justice Club and the Criminal Justice Honor Society that we had. Um, and they were just really great, and they had a lot of great experience too. A lot of the criminal justice professors, you know, they had years of experience on police forces, in corrections, in being a lawyer, doing private security. So it was nice to not only get to know them kind of almost as a friend and as a yeah. peer, but also have that mentorship and knowing that they have so much experience in the field we want to go into. And then uh, last question for you is, can you talk a little bit about some of the internships that were available in criminal justice? I know many of you have questions about internships as a whole, and we'll kind of talk a little bit about that later. But um, we did see some specific questions about internships within criminal justice. So what are available uh, in that way in that program? Sure. So Fairfield County is a really great location for internships within the field of criminal justice. There's a lot to do, especially with so many large cities um, like Stanford and Bridgeport. Uh, we have a really great relationship the university itself does with the Trumbull, Fairfield, and Bridgeport Police Department. So a lot of students will do internships there. Um, I myself did an internship down at the courthouse in Bridgeport. Um, and then I also had an internship at a correctional facility in Newtown that I got through one of my professors. So um, there's a lot to do. And we have a list of all of the internships and placements we've had for our, uh, like our practicum course that we have, the 390 CJ course, on our website. 
and it shows you all the places that we've had students go, whether it's law firms, uh, courthouses. I think we have students go to the Capitol at one point, so there's a lot of choices all right. to be had there. Thank you very much, Greg. Yeah. So Greg Diaz, uh, and uh, Greg's information is actually available on our website as part of the admission staff uh, at Sacred Heart. So if you have any further questions for Greg, uh, he is available um, to talk to, not so much being single, but he's a... Uh, Okay, no one wants to laugh at that one, all right. Uh, but uh, Greg, so Greg, uh, we thank you for uh, being up here tonight, and then uh, we will talk to you soon. All right, coming up next, uh, one of the larger areas of the College of Arts and Sciences is the School of Communication, Media, and the Arts. Uh, and here to talk a little bit about that is the Associate Dean for the College of Arts and Sciences and Director of the School of uh, Communication, Media, and the Arts, Dr. Jim Castingway. Hi, thanks. How are you? Good. So, uh, Jim, let's talk a little bit about the overview of uh, SCMA here sure. and what's available for students coming in as undergrads. Great. So SCMA has three departments, the Department of Art and Design, Communication Studies, and Media and Theater Arts. And I'm going to quickly list all of the stuff we do because I think if you're interested in any area of media or mass comm, you're going to hear it here. So we do art and design, graphic design, illustration, studio art, communication studies, public relations, advertising, sport communication, and sport media journalism, film and television production, digital communication, immersive media, VR, AR, XR, animation, broadcast news, theater arts, acting, musical theater, dance, performing arts, and music. And in all these areas, we also have an accelerated BA to MA, so you can complete that in as fast as one year. We have that in broadcast journalism and media production, strategic communication and PR, sport communication and media, and also a one-year program in film and television production as well. But we also have the only MFA in film and television production in the state of Connecticut. So that's a two-year degree. Yeah. Um, you know, we're coming to you live tonight from the Martiri Center for the Liberal Arts. Uh, this facility opened in 2015, and one of the larger areas within this building is the communications wing of the building. So can you talk a little bit about what's available in the way of technology and space for the students sure. in the program? Sure, but before I do that, I'll say that one of the things that we're most proud of is that we grew as a program department in this area before we had these facilities. And I think one of the reasons we did that was our faculty. So we've been able to hire strategically both PhDs and professionals. Mm -hmm. So that means, you know, to, to build on what Mark was saying, the liberal arts is an important part of our education. We're very uh, committed to that. So we hope that before a student picks up a camera to make a film or, or do some messaging campaign that he or she has thought about some things very deeply, including the Catholic intellectual edition and liberal arts and so on. So the way that I would think about it if I were a parent, uh, which I am, um, is that we do it all. Right? We give you that writing, critical thinking, liberal arts foundation, and from your first year, you're able to get your hands on equipment and start doing real things. So even our PhDs have worked in the industry, yeah. and you're always learning from them. So here in Materi, we have two television studios, post-production spaces, a motion capture lab, an amazing theater of screening rooms, um, multimedia classrooms, and then we also have some space in West Campus. Yeah, West Campus is located uh, just uh, about 500 yards down from where we are right now, uh, adjacent to the, camp the uh, main campus in Fairfield. That was General Electric's global headquarters right. uh, for um, three decades before we purchased it in 2016. We've been doing a lot of renovations on that space, including opening up brand new space this past semester That's for right. SCMA. We have a dedicated sound stage there in addition to the sound stage here for film and television production, finishing room, color correction. So, you know, whereas we used to grow um, on the strength of our faculty and our field production program, now we have it all. All right, let's talk a little bit about the faculty. Um, you know, you were talking about uh, some of the faculty being um, dedicated to their interests. Um, I, I know we have a lot of great faculty. Uh, and personally, for me, one that comes to mind is Professor Joel Castro. Uh, so could you talk a little bit about his sure. background and then some of the other faculty backgrounds that we have? Right. Well, Joel Castro is a great example of what I mentioned earlier. He's the former Rome bureau chief of NBC News. He was Tom Brokaw's producer, Brian Williams' producer. And so he, we were lucky that he uh, retired relatively young yeah. <laughs> and started his second career with us. Yeah. Um, we also have Paul Papps from The Dan Patrick Show, who still works. He's Paulie from The Dan Patrick Show, if you know that program. And he teaches in our sport uh, media programs as well. Okay. So there's an example of that even integrates into our internships. So we've had a sophomore this year um, who did an internship at The Dan Patrick Show um, 
Thanks for that connection. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, the, um, how quick a student who wants to do uh, production or wants to do behind the scenes, how soon they get into the studios, the labs, things of that nature? Yeah, we're really proud of the fact that we maintain enough equipment and that our curriculum is hands-on. We call it applied learning in the humanities. So uh, we take those liberal arts concepts and we teach you the history and theory of a particular discipline or medium, but then you're actually making and doing things right away. Okay. A couple questions that are coming in for you. So first off, do film students start film classes in freshman year? Sure. Yeah, um, you can. Uh, of course, we want to make sure that, I know, uh, you know, we have, we have cohorted students who are taking those liberal, liberal arts courses together. But you can log on and look at the major check sheets that we have online and you'll see that right out of the gate, we have a, a gateway course called 102 that you take, which is a hands-on production class right away. Yeah. And you could take video production one and those lower level classes uh, your first year. Okay. Um, do, uh, what types of uh, productions do you do during a given year? Um, everything you can imagine. So you heard the wide range of areas of film and media and television and communication that we do. Students are doing everything you can imagine from short form video to live broadcasts to messaging campaigns to social media. It's precisely this model of applied learning where you learn by doing real things and most importantly, often for real organizations. So we try not to do fake assignments. We try to do real assignments. So you work with actual businesses in the area to do work for them whenever possible. All right, uh, one of the big areas for students within SCMA is the ability to do on-campus uh, media, uh, such as our st uh, school newspaper, The Spectrum, uh, the TV shows that we have. Can you talk about student involvement in those uh, sure. groups? Yeah, we have a club for every area. Okay. So this is an opportunity, to come back to that earlier question, if you really want to start building your portfolio right out of the gate, you can jump into a club, and there's nothing stopping you from jumping into those projects. You know, from, from radio, we have a student radio station, we have a student television station, we have a public relations student chapter for the Public Relations Society of America. Um, you can jump on with the MFA students and, and help them with their films and start crewing right away with uh, uh, very impressive films from our MFA students. You can work um, in sport media club and a film club as well. Okay. Um, one of the uh, more exciting uh, aspects of this is the ability to study abroad mm -hmm. within SEMA. I know we had talked about that earlier mm -hmm. with Dr. Jerob. Talk a little about what um, exciting opportunities are available for sure. students in this. Well, we, we obviously have our own campus in Dingle, and students can do a full semester there. And when they're there, they actually do marketing materials and do real stuff for. We've done stuff for the tourism board in Dingle, for instance. We also have partnerships with. Uh, with universities in India, which is quite exciting, and, okay. are, uh, and are doing that as well. So there are some specific programs geared for students within communications, media, and things Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. We offer specific courses on Irish cinema, for instance, um, Indian cinema, okay. and integrating those production, that production work in as well. What do you think um, is the number one uh, entity or uh, realization that students are leaving with an education within SCMA, SCMA here at Sacred Heart? Well, I, I think our focus is on um, the creative aspects of, of, of media. So we don't know what kind of jobs are going to be waiting for students in three to five years, but we do know that the skills we give them will allow them to adapt. Okay, and my last question is, and you had mentioned this a little earlier, talk a little bit about those um, accelerated um, BA or BS to um, master programs sure. that students can and get involved with. We actually provide a pathway where our students can start those a little bit early, mm -hmm. um, but they're all 12 month degrees. So you, know, you can stay another year, build your portfolio. I encourage all of our students to test the job market and okay. hopefully they, um, what I love is when a student says, hey, I can't finish in a year because I got a job and I got to go to part time. Okay. All right, well, that was uh, Dr. Jim Cassingway from the School of Communication and the Arts here. Thank you very much. And could I also add that I'd, add be, yep. I'd be happy to um, do one-on-ones with anybody through WebEx and or FaceTime. And you could uh, find his information on the website under the uh, listing for the School of Communication and the Arts on their faculty and staff directory. Last thing. Okay. <laughs> uh, West Campus, we also are launching an augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality lab, which is really exciting. And that'll be starting this coming fall. That's right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Kassingway. One of the areas that I know many of you out there are looking to learn about, uh, for those of you looking to become teachers, uh, is our uh, preparedness program here for those of you in education. 
and that is through the Isabel Farrington College of Education. And joining us next is going to be the Dean of the Isabel Farrington College of Education, Dr. Mike Alfano, and the uh, Director of the uh, Teacher Preparedness Program at Sacred Heart, Dr. Renee Roselle. All right, good evening. Good evening. How are we doing? Yeah. All right. Uh, so uh, the Isabel Farrington College of Education uh, encompasses both undergraduate studies and graduate studies. Uh, can you first give an overview from the perspective of the dean about the college, and then part two of that, the uh, crossover with the liberal arts? Sure. So the, uh, the Farrington College of Education is it's an exciting time within the college right now. The college is growing. Uh, um, both at the undergraduate level uh, as well as at the graduate level, um, including programming and uh, uh, STEM uh, education, doctoral program, et cetera. But um, we, we are, uh, uh, to become an educator here, you're going to leave with a master's degree, regardless mm -hmm. if, you, if you're preparing uh, to become an elementary educator or in one of the second area uh, areas. Yeah. Uh, we are very focused on uh, practitioner-based uh, education, so we're going to get you into practice very early. Uh, in your career here as an aspiring educator. So uh, everything that you're learning in your classes, we're going to be getting you out into real school settings um, to uh, observe, learn, and practice what it is you're, you're, you're seeing here on campus in a variety of types of communities. So theory to practice is heavily emphasized within the college. Um, but at the core of any uh, teacher preparation program, in our opinion, are the liberal arts. And, and that's why we work so very closely with colleagues uh, in the College of Arts and Sciences here at, at Sacred Art University, um, both not only in our, in our interdisciplinary studies major, uh, which is the major that people take to become an elementary ed teacher, mm -hmm. uh, or in one of the actual content area majors, math, science. Um, uh, the sciences include biology and chemistry, uh, Spanish, English, history, um, and mathematics, yeah. yeah. Those are second areas that we're preparing people to become educators in as well. So there's a very, um, uh, intentional integration between our college and, and, and arts and sciences to make sure that the foundational content is there. Okay. Uh, and then we work very closely with candidates as they progress through their undergraduate years into a master's year uh, where they'll finish their program and be eligible for a Connecticut licensure in their chosen area. Okay. Um, I just want to uh, talk quickly with Dr. Rozell. So uh, this past year you joined us on the staff here at the university, coming to us from the uh, University of Connecticut, correct? So what initially drew you uh, to Sacred Heart's uh, Farrington College of Education? The exciting programming that was going on, and that's true. We we're developing and implementing so many new initiatives that are innovative and cutting edge, things that I wanted to be a part of that I knew were going to be exciting and prepare teachers in the way that I know we need to be preparing teachers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's break down the program. Sure. All right. So let's start first with, because um, many of the students that are looking at Sacred Heart are from out of state, yeah. um, out of state of the Connecticut, and they're also looking at other education programs throughout New England, the tri-state area. In the state of Connecticut, you cannot major in education for a bachelor's degree, correct? the actual Correct. bachelor's Correct. in education. Correct. So uh, let's first break it down. So for the undergraduate portion, if I want to be an elementary school teacher, uh, which in Connecticut is K through six, what would I be majoring in um, sure. as, an, as a major? Sure, so there are two options um, uh, that uh, a student who wants to become an elementary educator here at the university would pursue. One is, is what I mentioned earlier, the interdisciplinary studies major. Mm -hmm. And like the name suggests, you're going to be exposed to a variety of the different disciplines uh, that elementary ed teachers are responsible for. It. Um, the exciting thing about elementary education is you get to work with young people across science, mathematics, English language, arts, um, history, social studies, uh, those sorts of topics. So that's major one that okay. you could choose. And there's a more specialized uh, major that um, people can focus in on who are interested in, in elementary ed that we're very proud of actually. We're one of a few, ins uh, to, to Dr. Roselle's point, we're one of a few ins uh, institutions across the country that actually has, has an interdisciplinary but STEM focused option. Okay. So these are, this would be for a major uh, interdisciplinary STEM major, someone who's interested in being, becoming an elementary ed teacher, but really focusing in on those STEM areas as part of their uh, undergrad training. And, and that's again uh, housed very, uh, in the, in, with our College of Arts and Sciences in a very focused uh, um, uh, uh, degree experience for those candidates. And that's a uh, major that's sought after right now. Uh, the, the industry is looking for teachers that are available to teach STEM. Absolutely. Uh, given where economies are, are in the state of knowledge, right, so STEM focused, uh, STEM prepared elementary ed teachers, um, that will really jump out on someone's resume 
um, versus uh, um, someone who might be prepared in another area. So, uh, and it really ties in nicely with some of our graduate program as well. We actually have advanced, we have some advanced programming coming online now uh, in STEAM education and computer okay. science education. So folks who have a STEM interest, even at the elementary level, can continue all the way through to advanced degrees in, in STEM education and computer science, Very even cool. at the elementary level. So. Awesome. Um, Dr. Rizal, can you talk a little bit about now the secondary portion? So in the state of Connecticut, secondary being 7 through 12, mm -hmm. uh, what would be the track for a student at the undergrad level who would like to be a secondary ed teacher? Well, I really liked hearing um, the discussion about liberal arts and sciences because our candidates in secondary ed start with them. Mm -hmm. and they get a major in the content area and then start taking education courses with us in their junior year and are accepted into our five-year program at that point and then continue on with us through the master's year. So they are majoring in a secondary content area and then we prepare them in a secondary focused track to be high school and middle school teachers. Okay, uh, so um, either one can answer the questions that are coming. So when do you actually start the education program at Sacred Heart? You would technically start, we start working with you from the beginning of your entry here in kind of advising, but the coursework wouldn't start until the junior year. So there are opportunities throughout freshman and sophomore year to get involved with schools and students, mm -hmm. but the coursework would start in the junior year where building a course for freshmen and sophomores who are interested in education, both one that's more generalized for anybody and then one really specific to secondary educators. So to get involved early and um, be able to work with schools as well as take some coursework and get to know the faculty. Okay. Um, when um, would students apply for the master's program? Uh, so that's when they, mm -hmm. the second part, being a five-year program, four years undergrad, one year yeah. grad school for the master's, when would that graduation uh, uh, portion, graduate, excuse me, graduation, uh, graduate portion commence? When would that start? We start the process of enrolling people in that program, that five-year program, actually in their sophomore year. Okay. So that's when we start running information sessions, bringing people in, telling them what to expect, and they, once they go through that process, they really become part of that program from their sophomore year on. And during the undergrad experience, at any point, say from freshman year through senior year, are they have, are students able to do observation hours? Oh, yeah. In oh, gosh, yeah. Schools. yeah. Okay. Much more than just observ observing. They'll, they'll, they'll start with observing and then really be um, moved through um, successive sets of experiences in different communities where they'll, they'll culminate in actually uh, being the instructor of records uh, in a specific community. Yeah. So uh, they'll do that with lots of support, lots of training, but um, they'll, they'll be working with uh, a variety of children and young adults across uh, their, their experiences with our faculty, for sure. Um, question that came in, uh, this is, um, and then we'll move to the grad sure. portion, but on the undergrad level, can you major in Spanish um, as one of the options to be a secondary ed teacher? Oh, absolutely. Okay, so you and, can do it later. And in Connecticut, continues to be, uh, um, uh, world language educators um, continue to be in high demand, if not on our critical shortage, like comes in and off year to year, but uh, world language educators are in high demand uh, in this part of the, certainly across the country, but certainly in Connecticut, for okay. sure. Uh, all right, let's talk about the master's program. Uh, so it is uh, a one-year program. Uh, it begins um, right after the um, student would receive a bachelor's degree, uh, correct? Uh, can you talk a little bit about that one year? What's happening in that one year uh, for the master's of arts and teaching? Sure, so um, please jump in if you mm -hmm. need to. So we uh, will transition um, our undergrads uh, into the, what we call currently our internship year. Mm -hmm. And uh, right after they finish in May, they'll re actually begin graduate coursework um, in a variety of topics that starts to prepare them for the internship experience that which will launch typically in that fall in collaboration with a local school district. And um, they'll have a, a wide range of courses from assessment to different types of pedagogy, um, that they're comprehensive in nature, often tied uh, to mission here locally as well as everything to, to st state standards or national standards and state regulatory sort of requirements to become an educator. And then uh, they will then move into the fall and spring semesters where they will intern in a, in a community. Um, and that experience typically will culminate in a student teaching experience will build actually at the end of the experience uh, serve as the instructor of record in their chosen discipline, be it elementary education or one of the content areas 
uh, under the supervision of, of a specialized educator or a trained, specifically a trained educator in that community. So, uh, Dr. Rizal, uh during this whole portion of the fifth year with the combination of the internship and then the uh, student teaching, um, are students taking classes as well during this time? They are. Okay. They're taking methods courses, master's level coursework, um, some electives, there's an opportunity like Dr. Alfano was mentioning about cross-endorsement choices mm -hmm. that they can explore during that period of time too. So um, yes, it's a combination of an immersion really in a school district where they're getting lots of hands-on experience and then master's level coursework. All right, and then as they begin to wrap up this fifth year for the master's degree, what is in the way of certification and the policies and procedures that would happen with certifications first in the state of Connecticut because sure. that's where they would get yeah. their initial certification. So there's a variety of, um, as you can, might imagine, a variety of, of tests um, that have to be passed that are part of the Connecticut process. Uh, they, they vary slightly depending on discipline. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, uh, but the good news here is that uh, you're well prepared uh, and um, that once you, you are finished with your program and you successfully navigate those uh, state level tests, you will then be recommended by State Heart University to the Connecticut State Department of Education for your teaching licensure. Once you have that Connecticut licensure, that's your sort of passport into your back to your home state. Um, Connecticut has reciprocity with uh, upwards of 40 other states, uh, and uh, we, we, through our advising processes, we get to know our students very closely, and we'll, we'll understand what states people are from and what, student, uh, what states they're interested in teaching in post-graduation. So we'll be working with folks very closely well before the time they take their Connecticut credential to make sure that they're ready as soon as they take their Connecticut credential to return back to New Jersey, New York, um, yeah. et cetera. So um, lots, lots of cross, cross walking of the Connecticut credential, but earning that cred uh, Connecticut credential is really critical to beginning that process, process in other states. Now, one of the things that we get asked a lot in the admissions office, and I know we had one question here tonight, is you know, can I be certified at home? Um, if I'm from New Jersey or Massachusetts, and the answer is yes, you yeah. just have to take um, a crossover certif certification exam for that state, correct? Correct. All right. Correct. And uh, we'll, they'll be advised on that too. So, if new, uh, so we have at, at really at finger's tip uh, away what New Jersey's regs are. So we can advise that person from New Jersey, yeah. here's what's going to be involved once you take your Connecticut licensure. Oftentimes students will sit for those exams around the same time. So as they're sitting for their Connecticut licensure, they're, they're, they're going back to their home state and sitting for that same or a similar test because they're still really close to the content. Yeah. Um, and so that when the Connecticut credential has been issued, it's just a matter of catching up with the test scores that have already been addressed in, in the home state. And one of the things that we like to mention to students as well is that, you know, don't put the cart before the horse and the fact that you're planning five years out. Yeah. Because many of the students that go through the master's program here may even get a job offer from the school or school district Absolutely. in which that they do the internship or the student teaching, correct? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. It happens. So that is, yeah, so that's something to look forward to. Don't think that I'm just gonna go right back home. You know, there could be opportunities here. Yeah. Um, last thing I wanna talk about very quickly is, can you talk about some of the um, cross endorsements uh, that we have and then are there anything, anything new in the way of programs coming out for students uh, that they may be interested in tonight, three or four years from now? Well, the thing that I'm really, really excited about that really drew me to Sacred Heart was our Bridgeport Teacher Residency Program. It is, um, for anybody interested in urban education, it's a one-year immersive experience where you co-teach, co-plan, co-assess in one classroom in one school for the year, and then that leads to a guaranteed position in Bridgeport uh, for three years. So that's um, very cutting edge work. There, people call their programs residencies, but this is really going to be a residency program. Yeah. We're working closely with the National Center for Teacher Residencies, and it's one of the, it will become a hallmark of our program. And it's, it's launching the, in the fall of And it's 2020. one of the pilot programs in correct. the US, correct? correct. Absolutely. Yeah. Another exciting, and really for, for the class of 2024 to, to really be excited about um, is that as part of this sort of process that Dr. Rizal mentioned, um, we're really looking at in, uh, embedding an endorsement in special education in the near future. Okay. So we're working pretty rigorous, rigorously on that. It, it's very likely uh, that that will be ready oh, yeah. um, by the time uh, our colleagues who are joining Sacred Art University uh, for the class of 2024 it should be ready for them as well. Uh, so those are two uh, near-term uh, exciting uh, things that are in the pipeline and very, very uh, close to uh, getting off the ground here in the next few years. All right, and uh, last question I'm gonna to leave to you, uh, Dr. Sure. Alfano, as a member of the Dean's Council here at Sacred Heart, one of the deans of the colleges. 
Can you give just a, a short um, a piece of advice to the students out there about why Sacred Heart and why this time right now? So as a relatively recent arrival, I just finished my second year here, um, I was told during my interviewing process uh, all about the community that, that uh, Sacred Heart University is, and it sounded really nice, and certainly I had a really nice visit when I was on campus, but really after uh, having the opportunity to come here, um, it, it, it is absolutely true, and it's very hard to describe unless uh, you're, you, you're here. There is a sense of, 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 of being part of something bigger than yourself, um, certainly as teacher educators that's super important right people are working in communities but really when you're a student here you're going to be um, uh, uh, you know getting involved in things so critical to be part of that community but um, it really is a place that um, people can thrive and uh, and really be part of something bigger than themselves and, and it, it, it's um, something that um, I wasn't I wasn't um, you know it was described to me but uh, as it's come to life now you're living me, it, it, it it's, it's just it. really quite powerful awesome uh, so I'd like to thank Dr. Mike Alfano, Dean of the Isabel Ferrandi College of Education, as well as Dr. Renee Roselle being with us tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank All you. right. So we're going to bring Pam uh, Pillow, the Executive Director of Admissions, back up to uh, uh, close out. Uh, we have a couple minutes, and we're going to try to do lightning round uh, with some of the questions that we got in uh, so that we can get to them as quick as possible. So uh, some of the questions is, um, how many courses do a student, uh, does a student take a semester? On the average, it's between 12 and 15 credits that a student will take. Depending on if they're taking a lab for a science, that number might be a little bit higher, uh, but students most likely would be taking in the realm of 12 to 15 credits. Um, how would you describe uh, the freshman dorm experience? Um, <laughs> Very nice. Uh, one of the things about our residence halls is that they are modern, they are updated. Uh, we continue to build new residence That's halls right. so that you may be in something that was built uh, two, three years ago. That's right. Uh, so we want to make sure that you get the best in um, living to complement the learning that you're going to be Lots doing at the university, yeah, correct? Absolutely. All right. Um, another question that just came in uh, is coming uh, about the opportunity for work study on campus. Absolutely. Um, if you were awarded work study through your financial aid package, there is a lot of opportunities for work study on campus. When you come in your first week, there'll be an orientation for work study students, and then you'll be able to find different areas on campus that are available for positions, correct? Absolutely. Okay. Um, for, I'm going to give this to you, Pam. What is the process currently right now for students that have submitted a merit scholarship appeal? Okay, great. Our uh, financial aid office is reviewing all merit aid appeals currently. Uh, they're working on them. You should be receiving an update within two to three weeks. You're welcome to reach out to admissions um, and we can follow up on your behalf as well. Um, how many credits, can, uh, excuse me, can you transfer in college or high school credits from an accelerated college degree? Yes, so we do take college credits. You have to earn a B or better in those courses. They are reviewed by our registrar's office and will be applied appropriately to your curriculum of study. We also do take AP and IB courses if you test a four or higher. Okay. Uh, and then the last one here is, has the university extended the decision deadline of May 1st? Not currently. We are closely monitoring this situation that we're living through right now. Um, but right now, uh, our deadline is May 1st. We will update you if anything changes. So uh, that is going to wrap us up for this evening. Uh, just to uh, provide a few points of contact for those of you who are admitted students, uh, make sure that you are uh, in our Facebook group for the admitted class of 2024. Please, uh, please join. We're going to be setting a lot of announcements through that. So if you are not in the Facebook group, make sure you do it. Any parents watching out there, that Facebook group is specifically for students, not for parents. So uh, if you are adding, uh, we're going to see that you, you're not uh, uh, in the realm of a 17, 18, 19 year old. So unfortunately, you won't be accepted. Uh, but uh, we want as many students there as possible. Uh, the other thing that we want you to look at is our admitted student website, that's which correct. is welcome.sacredheart.edu. Once again, that's welcome.sacredheart.edu. A lot of great information on there as well resources for parents and students, uh, and a lot of great contests that you can enter to win some free shoe swag. Uh, and once again, we want you to reach out to your admissions counselor. Their information can be found on our website at www.sacredheart.edu slash staff. Uh, they are available for text, for email, for phone, and in some cases, video chats. So we want to connect with you as much as possible in this new virtual age that we're living in, uh, and we want to make sure that we can help you make the decision to become a pioneer come this May 1st. 
From all of us in the Undergraduate Admissions Office at Sacred Heart University, Pam Pillow, our Executive Director, from the University staff, administration, and alumni, I'm Rob Gilmore, the Director of Campus Experience at Sacred Heart University. Congratulations, Class of 2024. We hope to see you soon.